Fraudsters looking to boost profits on the sale of a vehicle roll back the numbers on an odometer, duping buyers into thinking the car has fewer miles on it than it does. Credit card fraud remains the most common type of identity theft in the U.S. Our estimate was that at the end of 2020, the U.S. was seeing about $11 billion worth of losses due to credit card fraud. We saw an increase from $30 billion to $40 billion lost to American consumers based on phone scams person hysterically crying on the phone said, I've been in a car accident. Greg, is that you? He said, yes. I gave them everything they needed. I lost $8,000, which was almost half of my savings. You might never have heard of it, but it's a type of fraud that affects nearly half a million vehicles and costs American consumers more than $1 billion every year. It's called odometer fraud. Fraudsters looking to boost profits on the sale of a vehicle roll back the numbers on an odometer, duping buyers into thinking the car has fewer miles on it than it does. American buyers lose an average of $4,000 a year to fraudsters, and most don't even know they have been hit. We would like to see justice for the individual that pays $45,000 for a car that's only worth fifteen. dollars Average used vehicle prices rose from about $20,000 in December 2019 to about $27,000 in December 2022. Supply chain disruptions and shortages in new vehicle inventory have pushed more customers to the used market, which in turn is pushing up prices. That's also making used vehicles more scarce. I can't tell you for sure, but I suspect with the recent uh, surge in used car prices that it's becoming more enticing tactic for scammers. Anyone can be a victim. And as vehicle technology improves, so does the technology criminals use. This is Kevin Porter. He and his five colleagues' jobs are to investigate cases where people tamper with car odometers to defraud customers or dealers. It is a bit of a stealth crime, one that can be very hard to detect. A lot of our uh, victims, they don't know they're victims until we reach out to them. Often that first interaction is explaining to somebody, this vehicle that you just paid $14,000 for, it could have been bought at auction a week earlier for $1,000. A single case of odometer fraud can and usually does involve several other crimes, which carry their own penalties. For example, every car comes with a title. That title typically has the mileage on the car at the time of sale. If you falsify the mileage on the title to the car, which you pretty much have to do if you change the odometer, you have also committed title fraud. If the vehicle is financed through a loan and the loan terms factor in the false low mileage as an indicator of value, that's bank fraud. Sometimes a fraudster will buy a car and then sell it without putting their own name on the title in order to avoid detection. That can be charged as aggravated identity theft because they are essentially pretending to be the person they bought the car from. Another example is wire fraud. Say, if the vehicle is posted on the internet, social media, or websites, or if the seller is using text messages to communicate with buyers about the vehicle, then, if you mail the paperwork, that is mail fraud. Odometer fraud carries a maximum sentence of three years. But the other forms of fraud that accompany it can increase a prison sentence by years or even decades. Lieutenant Jason Schrader is an inspector with the North Carolina Department of Motor Vehicles outside Charlotte. By the search warrant of a 2008 GMC Yukon. Like other sworn officers in his department, he carries a gun, a badge, and handcuffs. All right, let's see what we can do with this one. Schrader and his colleagues investigate car dealerships, used car lots, auto shops, and any other location where they have reason to believe people are rolling back or otherwise tampering with odometer and title information. A lot of complaints come from this area of Charlotte right here. Pretty big hotbed for people curb stowing cars or selling vehicles, dismantling cars, towing cars, storing cars, anything you can think of with cars. Once they make arrests, they seize and search vehicles, looking for evidence the odometer has been tampered with. Search warrant in the matter of a 2010 Jeep Grand Cherokee. The number of victims in any given case can also be staggering. Cases involving only a few vehicles and others involving thousands. 
Sometimes a customer with a lease will roll back an odometer before turning the car back in in order to keep the car under the mileage specified by the lease term. Sometimes a dealership will roll back an odometer on a used car or a car coming off a lease and then try to sell that car online. Sometimes it's just independent sellers. We've had cases where individuals buy a higher mileage vehicle, maybe a 300,000 mile SUV, they row the odometers back to 30,000 miles, and then they'll stage that vehicle out in an accident. And then insurance is paying out at the lower mileage value for the vehicle. Porter's office has also seen cases where people will roll back odometers to defraud a dealership into thinking work on the car is covered by warranty. About 10.5 million cars on U.S. roads are estimated to have had their odometers tampered with in some way. About 20% of those have had their odometers rolled back, a 7% increase over the previous year. Everybody from all walks of life could be affected by this. Uh, it's not just one demographic of people or one class of people. So this is a typical odometer cluster from some vehicles. Let's just say, hypothetically, you had a 2010 Nissan Altima that you wanted to sell. If you went to pull apart and found a matching Nissan Altima with a lot lower mileage on the cluster, you could pull that cluster, take it home, and replace it in the car that you have. And now your vehicle's value just increased because the mileage is lower. It might not seem like a lot, but the average loss to a customer is about $4,000. In addition to the difference in vehicle price, there can also be higher taxes, higher maintenance bills, and higher insurance. Experts think there is a lot of this type of crime going undetected, primarily because it's very difficult to detect. There's several very prominent cases that I've worked over the past few years where we had hundreds of vehicles involved, but the rollbacks on all those vehicles did not show up on any vehicle history report you could buy. Fraudsters seek out cars with gaps in their vehicle reporting history, which often includes vehicles serviced at home or vehicles serviced at shops that, for whatever reason, aren't logging and reporting mileage on the car. They would research the vehicle history. If there was a recent reporting, say within the past 12 months, that blocked them from rolling back the mileage, they wouldn't buy it they would go on to the next one that had the latest reporting was maybe three years ago. Cars older than 20 years are not required to have their mileage stated on the title. This also makes them attractive targets for fraudsters. Discovery often happens because one customer will notice something wrong with a car and report it to a local consumer protection bureau. From there, a case gets built. Just enough information to start digging into that dealership, those individuals. There's a tremendous amount of this fraud that's occurring all across the country. When most odometers were analog counters on the dashboard, rolling back an odometer was a matter of manually turning back the numbered dials. 20 years ago, we could turn the numbers back by hand. In the children's book and adapted motion picture Matilda, the eponymous character's father brags to the family that he rolls back odometers using a power drill. Two-directional drill. You run it backwards, the numbers go down. Watch your speed up. In the film Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the characters erroneously believe they can roll back miles on an odometer by suspending the car on cinder blocks and running it in reverse. The miles aren't coming off, going in reverse. It doesn't end well. what I do? Today, with digital odometers, the increased technical sophistication of a computerized dashboard has not stymied criminals. Many digital odometers can be manipulated just by plugging a device into a car's computing port and punching in some numbers. People think everything's digital, so everything seems, should be pristine. But the reality is, is that for a few hundred bucks, con owners can buy devices that will let them roll back thousands of miles instantly. As you can see, I'm on Google, vehicle odometer, odometer tools. You have all these different mileage correction odometer adjustment diagnostics tool, professional automotive scanner odometer adjustment tool, 
Odometer mileage correction, OBD diagnostic tool, $399 on eBay. Um, so you can see that they range from different manufacturers, different makes, and different pricing, depending on how much and how in-depth of the technology that you want to get. Other devices are harder and might require pulling out parts of a dashboard. However, they are far from undefeatable. There's different levels of skill that it's going to take, but we've not come across a vehicle that can't have its odometer road back. To be clear, buying an odometer correction tool is not illegal. There are cases where you can lawfully use one, such as if your odometer breaks. The more recent fraud we're seeing involves mileage blockers. These are devices that ship from overseas that you can download an app for your smartphone and turn your odometer on and off with the click of a button. If you drive your car for a thousand miles, your odometer is only gonna register a hundred miles. Obviously those devices are illegal and should not be used, but we see those in growing numbers showing up here in the United States. No rolling back is necessary. The owner can still take the car into service shops, allow them to log the miles on the odometer, and eventually sell the car with what looks like a full history of regular service on a low mileage vehicle, when the actual mileage might be far higher. Those are the ones that kind of keep you up at night because those are more difficult. There's other ways we get to those individuals that are doing it, those fraudsters. Ultimately, like other frauds, odometer fraud has real-world impacts on real people. My dad was actually a victim of odometer fraud. He bought a car out of South Carolina, and the odometer had been rolled back 65,000 miles. And he didn't contact me, he didn't do his research, and he didn't know who the guy was or where he bought it from. It was a very good deal on a vehicle, and he fell for it. So if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And if it doesn't feel good in your gut, then don't do it. Credit card fraud remains the most common type of identity theft in the U.S., accounting for over 40% of all identity theft reports. A total of 271,823 cases were reported in 2019, more than doubling from the numbers reported in 2017. You feel violated. Anger, there's anger. For me, there's anger. Some, some of the other people I talk to are afraid. I just, I get mad. I get mad. Somebody, some clown stole from me. This is big business. These are organized crime rings that are behind the vast majority of this fraud. Um, and their operations are industrialized, they are automated. The Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta estimates that over 75% of consumers in the U.S. have at least one credit card and that card fraud losses in the U.S. amounts to a little more than a dime for every $100 they spend. We really do have a big problem in the U.S. We are big targets um, and part of it is because we let our guards down and we're not we're not quite as secure with our payment information because we like convenience. Our estimate was that at the end of 2020, the U.S. was seeing about $11 billion worth of losses due to credit card fraud. Um, the vast majority of that is online. So why is credit card fraud so hard to stop in the U.S.? And how detrimental is it to the U.S. economy? Credit card fraud occurs in one of two ways, card present or card not present. For years, card present frauds were the most popular type of card frauds, where perpetrators were presenting stolen or counterfeit cards in order to make a purchase. Most credit card fraud nowadays, however, are card not present, usually involving online or over the phone exchanges where a physical card doesn't have to be presented. Card not present fraud is very easy to commit. So all you need to do is make a fake identity and steal a credit card number and you're in business and you can start committing card not present credit card fraud. If you're going to commit fraud in a card present world, you need to get something that can duplicate a card, you have to buy the plastic, you have to learn how to copy that chip, it becomes very complicated. Whereas card not present fraud, you know, even, even kids can do it, it's so easy. There are numerous ways that criminals can gain access to your credit card information. It can be as simple as looking over your shoulder while you're making a purchase, 
or as complex as a massive hacking operation, like the 2017 Equifax security breach that involved more than 200,000 credit card numbers. But to make matters worse, criminals are getting smarter and more high tech every year. The dark web and cryptocurrency has essentially provided uh, a platform for all the different pieces of the fraud ecosystem to interact and, you know, sort of greased, uh, greased the wheels there. Equally vulnerable are all of the small businesses, your, your local pizza chain or your dentist, you know, all of these people that are also collecting your payment data. You know, they don't have necessarily these big IT departments to make sure that their infrastructure is secure. And, and actually the organized crime rings love to pick on these little guys where you can get, you know, 2,000, 5,000 card numbers with a single breach. Criminals, however, aren't the only ones responsible for credit card fraud. In recent years, companies have seen a massive increase in what's known as friendly fraud. That's fraud committed by ordinary consumers out of a mistake, made possible by the rise in e-commerce designed to make purchasing easier than ever. Companies like, you know, Google and Apple and iTunes, 80% of the fraud that they see is actually this friendly fraud. So it's where consumers are just calling and they don't necessarily recognize the transactions. These could be transactions performed by accident or even by their children without the cardholder's knowledge. Should that be considered fraud? And who is liable for the cost? That is a huge problem that the industry as a whole is facing, is what are we going to do about all this friendly fraud? According to the most recent Nielsen report, payment card fraud losses reached nearly $28 billion worldwide. The United States alone is responsible for more than a third of the total global loss, making America the most card fraud prone country in the world. Part of it is that we are a very rich country and part of it is because we let our guards down and we're not we're not quite as secure with our payment information because we like convenience. The economic cost of card fraud goes far beyond the cost of illegally purchased merchandise. Businesses often spend millions to protect themselves from fraud, buying software and hiring security experts to monitor transactions. Fraud is kind of like an arms race. Whatever technology is being implemented, the fraudsters will eventually figure out a workaround. So you have to be constantly investing in those technologies. And, and that is a cost of doing business. And in fact, um, there's a bunch of different companies out there that estimate it's anywhere between 10 to 20 cents out of every hundred dollars is spent on fraud prevention tools and fraud losses. When a card fraud is identified or reported, what kind of fraud was committed determines who is responsible for the chargeback. For card present, it's usually the bank that has to bite the bullet. However, with more prevalent card not present crimes, it's the merchant that's responsible for the chargeback. Unfortunately, this includes small businesses that might not be able to afford such a loss. Chargeback fees can often range from $20 to $100 per transaction, in addition to the cost of product or service. So for a big business, they can absorb a loss, um, even a pretty significant loss. So if I have $10,000 worth of fraud in a month, um, you know, a big company might go, ouch, you know, it might hurt their bottom line, but it really won't affect the business that they have. If a small, you know, one shop business or a restaurant all of a sudden has a $10,000 loss, that could be the difference between making payroll and not making payroll for that company. There are several regulations designed to protect consumers from incidences of credit card fraud. The Fair Credit Billing Act allows consumers to dispute any charges in their statement. The Electronic Fund Transfer Act and Truth in Lending Act, more commonly known as Regulations E and Z, are also designed to protect consumers from fraudulent charges and potential billing errors. The amount was 14,000 and some dollars. It was a big amount. I didn't, and I didn't lose one penny. U.S. Bank did everything right, including denying all the fraudulent transactions. So the, the tr they were attempted, but the, the transactions never went through. I didn't, I didn't lose anything. However, experts say there just aren't enough regulations protecting small businesses from chargebacks caused by fraudulent transactions. Small businesses, you know, they, they don't have these robust fraud operations. They generally can't afford really expensive technology that can help, you know, assess the risk of fraud and help to control it. You know, these are folks that just stood up a storefront and they, they want to sell their stuff. Experts contend credit fraud is such a difficult problem to solve in the United States for two reasons. 
The first issue is that credit card thefts often go unreported, uninvestigated, and unpunished by law enforcement. Small businesses rarely get law enforcement involved as they rarely succeed in catching the criminal. Big businesses also don't report it out of worry that it would reflect them in a bad light. And a lot of card frauds go unnoticed by consumers after banks automatically clear bogus charges. The reality is it's so common and it's so cross-jurisdictional that it becomes a very difficult thing for law enforcement to actually go after unless it's, you know, a very, very large fraud ring that, you know, you can demonstrate um, has done severe damage. OK, then it's, you know, worth putting together a uh, multi-jurisdictional sort of task force and going after them. When the fraud happened, I, I contacted the one person in the FBI that I knew, and we did trade a couple of emails back and forth. And then he said they were going to send it to the to the F. I, I packaged all that stuff up and sent that off. He said we're going to send that to Florida to our office in Florida. So he forwarded it to Florida. That was it. That was it. That's the last I heard. That was it. The sad fact is, if you're a credit card card fraud victim or an identity theft victim, you are on your own. There's not a human being. There's no law enforcement agency on the planet that's going to help you. And so that's just that's just that's just the way it is. And it. That needs to change. When asked for comment, the FBI said they look into each reported complaint and diligently work to investigate fraud. However, they do not comment on specific investigations. The other issue is banks and big businesses who are most capable of initiating change have no incentive to eliminate card frauds forever. For companies like Visa and MasterCard, they make a lot of money off of the transactions. And, you know, I mentioned the fees that merchants will pay around fraud. There's a lot of companies that make money off of fraud. So when fraud happens, it's, it's, it increases their bottom line. So the players that might actually solve the problem are not necessarily financially incented to solve the problem because they have a revenue stream that they don't want to disappear. In response to these claims, MasterCard said the company invests in technologies, processes, and expertise to prevent, detect, and resolve potential threats. Visa said it is focused on maintaining the integrity of the payment network through AI technology and that merchants and banks only incur fees from fraudulent transactions if they cannot meet standard thresholds for fraud prevention over time. The problem, however, is getting worse. Nielsen Report estimates that card fraud losses could climb above $40 billion worldwide by the year 2027. The COVID-19 pandemic is also playing a major role in the explosive growth in card fraud activity. So the attacks are currently not being successful, but the, the number of attacks has increased. What happens in every economic downturn, though, is that the attacks do start to become more successful. And so over the next two to three years, I fully expect credit card fraud numbers to increase in a pretty meaningful way. Most companies are looking toward technological solutions to solve credit card fraud, like machine learning or the EMV chip. The effect of the chip is that it makes point-to-point -point fraud, physical fraud, uh, much harder to perpetrate uh, because it's an encrypted communication. While some European countries have mandated a multi-authentication system known as 3D Secure that has shown promising results, chances of seeing it in the U.S. is slim. In America, we are the one-click buy, we want everything now, super convenient. And so our tolerance um, for uh, adding friction to the checkout process is very low. There's a lot of fear that it's going to be way too much friction and people are going to abandon shopping carts and not know what to do. Um, U.S. consumers are notoriously adverse to friction, and so I just don't see that we're going to see any sort of mandate like that happen here anytime soon. Advisors believe that educating consumers and collaboration between merchants, issuers, and shoppers are two vital steps in combating card fraud. Consumer awareness is, is certainly helpful. So just having basic practices like keeping an eye on your bank statement, checking it out once a week to make sure there's no unauthorized purchases. Um, you know, having the awareness that you know, having the same set of username passwords across all of your online relationships is not a good idea. However, most experts also agree that the U.S. is far from ending card fraud. Okay, here, let's be depressing for a second. 
I don't see it being solved under the current construct. As long as there's data breaches, there's going to be, uh, you know, fraud being perpetrated and that, that data being monetized somehow. Now, I can't imagine scenarios where the way fraud is, is being perpetrated has changes dramatically. And so it may look very different, um, but, you know, as long as money is being transferred digitally, it's going to be a problem. It was a normal day. I was sitting in the kitchen, puzzling. The phone rang, I answered it. Hello? A person hysterically crying on the phone said, I've been in a car accident. I have a broken nose and a split lip. Greg, is that you? He said, yes. He said, you need to call my lawyer. He gave me a number and a name. He said, please don't tell anybody. I said, please let me call your father, please. He said, no, please don't call daddy, I'll explain later. He said, you need to call my lawyer, you need to get me out of here. And he gave me his telephone number and name. I called the public defender who said, he hit a pregnant woman, eight months pregnant, and she had a broken wrist. The good thing was, she didn't lose the baby, she's stable. He said I needed, in order to get him out, I needed to get $8,000. And he said it needed to be in cash. They said don't call anybody. You can't tell anybody. Drove to the bank, got the money. Then I called back. I, I gave them everything they needed. He said he would see if they had a courier to pick up the money. They told me to put it into a shoebox and the courier walked up the driveway and he took the money, threw it in the back seat, <laughs> and he left. Then I waited. I thought it would take time for the judge to let my grandson out. So I waited for a little while and I tried to call my grandson after a couple hours to reach him. I didn't reach him. He called me finally and I said, when did you get out? And he said, what? What are you talking about? And that's when I knew. I was so emotional and shaken that I wasn't thinking at all. I lost $8,000, which was almost half of my savings. In a nutshell, any inbound communication that tries to defraud people of money, uh, whether that is a voice scam, uh, which we call a call, a phone call, which we call vishing, or it is a text message, a fraudulent text message, or a scam text message, which we call smishing, SMS phishing. Um, they look very similar to what we've come to know in terms of email spam and, and phishing, but they're much more immediate. And actually there's a very tight call to action, which is why the phone is the perfect device to attack. In 2021, the Federal Trade Commission or FTC received about 1.8 million fraud complaints. In about 36% of those complaints, the contact method began with a phone call. Phone scams come in many forms, but officials have categorized the most common ones. Imposter scams, debt relief or credit repair scams, business and investment scams, charity scams, extended car warranties, free trials, loan scams, prize and lottery scams, and travel and timeshare scams. 82-year-old New Jersey resident Libby Moore became the target of an imposter scam in September. Normally, I don't answer the phone. This time I did, and the phone, I did not know who was on the phone. Most of the times, I never answer the phone unless I know who's calling me. Phone scams have been on the rise. As of May 2022, about 70 million Americans have fallen victim to a phone scam in the past 12 months. So we saw an increase from $30 billion to $40 billion lost to American consumers based on phone scams. One is that it's very cheap, right? It's very cheap to set up an automatic dialer 
and to plug a bunch of phone numbers into it, whether they're random or they 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 are very intentional、uh, by geography or by demographic, and place millions of phone calls in a very short period of time because it's a numbers game, right? We know that not everybody's not going to be susceptible, but you don't have to get that many. I think the second reason is that the mobile telephone is the mobile device is ubiquitous. Everybody has one, and we all spend far too much time looking at them, and that's all demographics. You want me to buy thirty thousand dollars worth of Target cards, Mark? You might have seen videos around the internet of content creators who are sort of scamming the scammers. Let me get this straight: it's that if I don't get you the money today, you're gonna lose your job. Hey, I'm Kit Boga, and I spend the majority of my time trying to convince scammers that I'm the perfect victim. In general, scam baiting is becoming the perfect target for a scammer, baiting them into believing that they should spend all of their time and effort focusing on you.、Um, these guys will make thousands of calls, trying to get somebody who will say yes. I will let you on my computer, or I will go buy gift cards, or whatever their scam is. And so, my job, or a scam baiter's job, is to become that perfect victim who seems like they're going to comply with everything.、Uh, but in the end, we are just collecting information and reporting it to like fraud professionals, or otherwise wasting their time. Almost every scammer that I've talked to will give some sense of urgency. And they will de- kind of make demands as if you have to respond right now. You have to listen to everything that they're saying. They'll often tell you not to hang up the phone. No, 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 no! Don't look, don't hang up. You have to do this right now. Don't talk to any of your family members. It's very. They're trying to take advantage of the moment. All I heard was you're not allowed to tell anybody, and you know. If I had just called one person, the, they could have talked me down. We could have rationalized it. I, I wasn't thinking at all. I was just shaken. My whole body was shaken, and I was emotional. If they have your attention and you're trusting them, they have to make their scam happen immediately, because they know that if you hang up and talk to someone else in your family, or you stop and you start to think about what's happening. Often you will realize that something doesn't add up. So yeah, a common thread is the the urgency and the threats. My job is at stake because、uh, it was my mistake. Instead of putting up the a number correctly, I、oh, entered the number wrong. Mistake. Contrary to popular belief. Younger Americans appear more likely to lose money to a phone scam than their older counterparts. Also, men are more likely to be scammed than women. I do think it's a very common misconception that only the older generation gets scammed. I see it in YouTube comments or in, in conversations with people, but I get emails and messages probably every day、uh, of, of someone falling for a scam, and most of those messages are are younger people. And and they'll tell me their stories about whether it was a dating scam or some of them are the, the these tech support scams, and a common thread is they were busy, they weren't really paying attention to the the script or what was going on, and and they they fell for it.、Um, and so I think any it can happen to anyone. And I'm surprised that young people are getting scammed because I find that young people don't trust. The way we do it, from my generation, I think they're less trusting. One, they really are attached to their phones. Two, because so much of this is based on social engineering, the younger generation has exchanged convenience for privacy, and they share so much about their lives on social media that it's very easy to go in and say, "Okay, I know where he went to school. I know who his connections are. I know where he works." I know what he buys, right? And so, if you think about the, the the ability for social engineers to get that type of information and target individuals, it's much easier in that set. Don't answer the phone, especially if you don't know the number. 
let him leave a voicemail if you want, and you can listen to it later. And when it comes to the texts, do not click on links that are in text messages, right? Make sure, unless you can, it's a very simple thing to do. If you get a text, scroll up and see if you've ever gotten a text from them before. Ask them for a case number. If it's your credit card company and they're saying there's a problem with your credit card account, ask them for a case number, ask them for their employee ID and hang up and then call the number on the back of your credit card. Like make sure that you know who you're calling. It's so easy for someone to spoof a phone number from your local police department or from your credit card company. So I, I try to tell people, keep that in mind. Register with the, the FTC's do not call list, right? Make sure that you just go to the FTC website. You'll find it very easy if you just search for do not call and register with that on that list. That means nobody uh, that doesn't have a relationship with you that you haven't consented or given permission to call you is supposed to be able to call you. Uh, businesses should only be able to call you if they have a relationship with you. I, I, we're vulnerable. I, I, you know, I, I hate the thought that there are people like this in the world that would do something like this. I feel sorry for these people who do this because they are very sad human beings.